G'day, I'm Paul. Mazda claims to have revolutionised the internal combustion process with an engine that gives you the benefits of a diesel plus the benefits of a petrol. And they've called the technology Sky Active X. And that is what we're testing out today. You know, I'm a keen technology buff, so I want to see whether this actually works or if it's a bit of a gimmick. This is only available in the top spec Astina and you can get it in the hatch or the sedan. You can also get it with a six speed auto or a six speed manual. It's priced at just under $42,000 for the automatic or $1,000 less for the manual and this really only competes with cars like the Toyota Corolla Hybrid in terms of fuel efficiency. Today we're going to do a detailed review to see whether it works and what it's like behind the wheel. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review you can use the time codes up on the screen there or if you're on YouTube just scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already I'd love it if you could hit subscribe and also press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive something revolutionary. Let's talk exterior. You've got eight colours to choose from and the metallic colours are $495 extra. The rest are free of charge. I love the design here. I know we've reviewed the Mazda 3 before, but I just got a comment here on how good this thing looks. It is a styling proposition and I think that's the path Mazda is heading down, especially with some of the premium pricing they're coming up with at the moment. So you can see the big Mazda logo there and this huge grill. The grill has this kind of 3D printed material on the front. It's really cool. It's a bit like a cheese grater. Uh, and then you can see here that there's black highlights around the car to really sort of help divide the colours. Works well here with this sort of, I don't know what you'd call this colour, it's like a grey gunmetal type thing. You have full LED headlights with LED daytime running lights, front parking sensors down there. If we zip around to the side, you've got 18 inch alloy wheels. Quite a nice looking alloy wheel. It matches up with those black highlights around the headlights. So you're getting that really uh, sort of dark theme to the car and it really suits that stylistic approach they're going for. Have a look down the side here. So the wing mirror has the indicator built into it, but this whole profile is very soft and rounded. A lot of cars these days have these edgy lines down the side of the car, whereas this is all just about smooth surfaces, all the way down here to more black highlights. Now come around to the back. Mazda's taillight game has picked up immensely with LED units here. And I love this design with the four pods of LED lights for the indicator, it looks really nice. Now this is how you're gonna be able to tell that this has this revolutionary engine, Skyactiv X, and they've popped the badge on the back there. Uh, more black highlights down the bottom, and again, it's just a way to differentiate the styling here of the top spec Astina model. So we're inside the Mazda 3 now, and you can see here that this top spec looks fantastic. I love these lashings of red highlight they have along the dashboard, and the beautiful stitch lines you can see there. You've got these air vents hidden down here, plus a little faux vent. It's just really nicely presented, and I think Mazda's really nailing styling at the moment. They're putting a lot of effort into making sure the car feels and looks premium, and you kind of have to when you're charging what, almost $42,000 for this car. So I think they've gone that one extra step they need to to make you feel better about spending this kind of cash. What about build quality? Not fantastic. I mean, I would expect that to be fairly sort of stable. The rest is okay, but you know, I think this kind of stuff just is a bit of a letdown because you expect it to be nice and sturdy and not sort of moving around easily when you go to open it. Now, how soft are the key surfaces in this cabin? Well, we have a hardness tester, also known as a durometer, and I've tested the surfaces. If you're interested to see how this car compares to other cars, just go down to the description. I've got a link there to a table where you can see what other results look like. Okay, let's talk infotainment. The all new Mazda infotainment system is called Mazda Connect. It replaces MZD Connect. Now, if you do want a full detailed infotainment review, you can click up here. But today what I'll do is just walk you through the basics, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, plus the screen ahead of the driver. So it consists of an 8.8 .8 inch display. It's gone away from being a touch screen, so you can't touch any of that anymore. It's all controlled here using this iDrive-esque controller. It allows you to flick through the different menus. One thing that I will point out here that's specific to the Skyactiv X is the fuel efficiency monitor. It shows you which parts of the engine are running, how full the battery is that's used underneath the body of this car. I'll show you what that looks like when we're driving later on, but this is the key difference between this and other Mazda models. Now in terms of audio, you have AM, FM and DAB plus digital radio. You also have the ability to stream USB devices and also Bluetooth devices. If you do want to connect your smartphone, there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto built in, but both of those will require a cable. It's not a wireless system. The integration's good, but the only downside is because it's not a touchscreen, you have to use this rotary controller to skip through all the different parts of the screen and it kind of takes forever to scroll through to reach the right hand side menu. I think that integration could be a little bit better, but it is a bonus that it takes up the entire screen. 
In terms of communications, you have Bluetooth connectivity for your phone if you don't have smartphone mirroring, and then you can control that using the voice recognition system. It generally works pretty well, allows you to call contacts and also put in navigation addresses. And in terms of the built-in navigation, it works fairly well. It's quick and easy to use, and entry of destination addresses can be done with a full address or via points of interest. There's also a seven inch display ahead of the driver that has your tachometer in a digital display plus your energy consumption. You can configure this to display different things. So if you press the info button, it'll cycle through to your safety settings. There's also a speed sign readout built into that display. And then there's a head up display ahead of the driver as well with speed sign recognition and also a digital speedometer. Okay, moving on from infotainment to the rest of the features that you get standard. So dual zone climate control. I do love these knurled switches on that climate control system. Heated seats for the front row, a heated steering wheel for those chilly mornings. You get two USB ports, one here and then one inside the glove box with a 12 volt outlet. You've also got a sunroof fitted standard and then moving on to the safety technology, you have low and high speed autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection, semi autonomous lane keeping assistant and radar cruise control. You have blind spot monitoring built into the wing mirrors, front and rear cross traffic alert. And I want to show you the reverse view camera. So it's a 360 degree camera, but the quality is really high. So you can see here with the reverse element, you can clearly see out the back there, it works really well at night and then it paints you that 3D picture. Now, when you do switch over to drive, it automatically switches to the front camera. So you don't really need to do anything and you get guidelines out the front as well. So really nice integration and I like the way they've put it all in that screen. Now, what does the key look like? Glad you asked. Here it is. So this is the front of it. You can see the Mazda symbol there, a black backing. You get a bit of brushed chrome, nothing on the back. And then you get a lock and unlock button. It's a proximity sensing key. So you just leave that in your pocket, grab the door handle and then hit the start button to start the car. Okay, moving on to practicality and let's start with storage. Where are you going to put your phone? So there's plenty of little nooks around here up the front that you have the perfect little holder for the phone. It doesn't have wireless phone charging, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, you do have two cup holders down the front there that'll hold the phone as well. But what about bottles? So they easily fit into there. You've got nice little teeth to hold them into place. And then inside the door, you've got storage for a bottle plus odds and ends. Near the driver's foot, you have a little coin tray. And then you have this center console that's movable, by the way, so you can go forwards and backwards. And then it's pretty deep. You can actually fit a fair bit of stuff in there, which is great. Over here, the glove box, that's pretty reasonably sized too. There's lots of room in there. And then overhead, you have sunglass storage as well. Now, what about comfort? It's probably what I like the most about this Mazda 3. The seats are so damn comfortable. They hug you in nicely and they're really soft and plush. They just feel great. So big tick for the seats. These are electrically adjustable, but only for the driver. You do get memory. It's just a shame that with the passenger side, you have to manually adjust the seat. Now, what about the reach of all the controls? All super easy to do from here and all within a logical location. I can sort of take my eyes off the road to quickly increase the temperature if I need to. Steering wheel sits nicely in the hand too and then you've got paddle shifters located behind there. Righto, let's talk back seat. Not much room if I'm honest. Uh, my knees are literally digging into that seat. Keep in mind I do have this seat quite far back but there is barely any leg room there. Toe room is virtually non-existent either. I can barely move my toes there. So yeah, it's a really cramped space and it's a bit tricky to see out of the car. That rising belt line kind of prevents you from getting vision outside. So yeah, I feel a little claustrophobic in here. And headroom, incredibly bad. So yeah, this isn't a space that you really want your friends to be in the back on if they are taller. I guess it's fine for kids and stuff, but for adults, this isn't really that, that decent a space to be seated. Uh, center armrest, decent cup holders with little rubber bits to hold the bottle in and then you can also fit that inside the door with a bit of space either side. Isofix points on the two outboard seats, got matte pockets in, sorry, matte pocket just in the passenger seat, there's none on the driver's side. You've got air vents here as well but no USB charging. So this swoopy hatch design may look good but unfortunately it eats into the boot space. So you have 295 litres of cargo space available which is less than the outgoing Mazda 3. A little bit disappointing, but I'll walk you through what it looks like and how our luggage fits in. So beneath the cargo floor, you have a space saver spare tire, plus a subwoofer and all your tire jacks and all that sort of stuff. You have a little LED light tucked into there and then your top tether points. I'll show you how this comes off. It's a pretty straightforward process. And that sort of lobs under there. Pop our luggage in. Now the interesting thing here is I don't think this will fit if we go 
that way. So you've got to go around that way. Now, if you do want to drop the seats, it is a case of pushing these levers down and then the seats disappear. And the other problem with that is that they don't disappear if your front seats are pushed back. So you have to then manually go and move them forward and then push the seats down. Okay, before we start driving, let me run you through Sky Active X and what it actually means. This bit's a little bit technical, so if you're not interested in listening to all that sort of stuff, you can skip ahead. But if you want to know how the process works, stay right where you are. Mazda kind of coins this car as a hybrid, but it's not a traditional hybrid like a Corolla hybrid, which can run entirely switched off. This is a mild hybrid system. So a mild hybrid system, you may have heard us talk about that before. And if you want a more detailed explanation of what that means, click up here to have a look at our Mercedes-Benz GLE review. The Mazda uses a 24 volt mild hybrid system with a motor generator. This allows the car to start much smoother than it would with a standard starter motor. And that means when it is rolling to a stop, it switches off earlier at around 22 kilometers an hour. And then when it restarts, you barely notice that it's kicking back on. And this is a 24 volt system, not a 48 volt system. And it's also used to charge a small battery that sits between the wheel arches. But the engine under the bonnet is the bit that's unique to Mazda. It's called spark controlled compression ignition. And it blends the benefits of a diesel engine with a petrol engine. So how does it all work? So these overlays on the screen will help explain it a little bit better, but the basis of it is that during the intake, you get a lean air fuel mixture. So that is a whole lot more air coming into the chamber instead of a mixture of air and fuel. Then during the compression stroke, you get atomized fuel pumped into the chamber at 700 bar. Now, once that ignites using that spark plug, it delivers a high energy charge. And that of course means that you're able to push the piston head down harder and faster and that means you're generating more power and torque during that expansion process. So how does that relate to a diesel engine? Well, a diesel engine works with a similar process. They don't actually use a spark plug in a diesel engine. It's basically a compression process that self-ignites. So what they've been able to do here is simulate that high lean compression process in a diesel except with the atomized fuel, you can spark it and that creates that rapid expansion. So that all works at the lower end of the rev band. As the rev band increases, the engine's able to switch back to a standard internal combustion mode that you'd find in any other car. So you're filling that small gap that a diesel engine works well at, which is low RPM. And then when you get to the high RPMs, you just go back to running it as a regular engine. That then means you get an air fuel mixture of 15 to one here in the Sky Active X, which compares to around 13 to one in a regular internal combustion Mazda engine. That of course means less fuel in the long run. So we've hit the road in the Sky Active X Mazda 3. Under the bonnet, it's a two litre naturally aspirated petrol engine. It makes 132 kilowatts of power, 224 Newton meters of torque. And that's in comparison to a two and a half litre you'll find in the Astina if you don't option this engine. It is worth noting as well that, that 224 Newton meters of torque occurs at 3000 RPM. So it's not quite as low in the rev band as you'd find with a turbocharged car, but it is lower than you'd find with a naturally aspirated engine regularly. It's then mated to a six speed automatic transmission and that's just a regular transmission. So no dual clutch business here, no CVT. It's just a regular torque converter. It's actually a really pleasant transmission and it works well when it comes to its stop start system. So I'll show you how that works. You basically roll to a stop and when it gets to around that 22 kilometer an hour mark, the engine kicks off and then you roll out of the brake and then it starts again. It is entirely seamless. You can barely feel it working. And that's what I love about these mild hybrid systems. They've taken that shunt out of a regular stop start system that you know everyone just switched off because it was too uncomfortable to use, whereas this is completely imperceptible. So how do you know that this is all active? Well, you have this display here that tells you when the compression ignition system is running. And it also tells you the charge level of the onboard battery and when I stop is ready and also which parts of your car are contributing to eye stop not being ready, such as air conditioning or the battery state. Now this is front wheel drive here in the Mazda 3. There are all wheel drive versions of the Mazda 3 available in other markets, but we are front wheel drive only. If you do want this engine with an all wheel drive drivetrain, it is coming in the CX-30, the same engine setup, but it will be all wheel drive instead. Now let's talk the all important fuel economy. Mazda claims five and a half liters per 100 kilometers with the Sky Active X version of the Mazda 3. If you compare it to the G25, the two and a half liter version of this exact same car, that's at six and a half liters. So it's almost 20% fuel economy gain with using this. But if we jump over here, 
we're currently at 9.1 litres per 100 k's. So it's not actually that good. You don't really see the benefits here. When we tested the Corolla Hybrid, that is actually pretty much as claimed. It sits around that five and a half litres per 100 k mark. This is nowhere near that claim. It's almost double what it says on the box. So really isn't that impressive when it is put to the test and put through regular driving conditions. Now, what about engine noise? We're going up a hill here, 3000 RPM. It's holding the gear. There is a fair bit of noise coming into the cabin. And I don't know whether it's that technology that simply is a little bit noisier when it reaches the high end of the rev band there, but there is a fair bit infiltrating into the car. I mean, it's not such a bad thing. It's not an unpleasant noise like a diesel, but it is still quite noticeable when you get stuck into it. Now, the only downside to all of this, in addition to you know the fuel economy not being that flash, is that you require 95 Ron premium unleaded all the time. You won't be able to stick 91 into this. And on top of that, this carries about 60 kilograms extra weight on top of the G25 to facilitate all of that Sky X mild hybrid technology. Now, what about acceleration? We'll pop it into sport mode here. It sort of dives back through the gears. Give it a punch. Look, it feels reasonable. It's fairly thrashy once you get stuck into it. And um, look, it doesn't sort of pull your face off, but it doesn't feel any slower than the G25, which is the two and a half litre version, which I guess is to be expected. Um, but it's not quite as sort of uh, pushy as I thought it would be. Like in the Corolla Hybrid, for example, you can feel when you're getting the assistance with the hybrid components. Whereas here, if I'm looking at this display when I get stuck into it, it doesn't really feel like there's all that much assistance coming from that lithium ion battery pack. And like I said, like it's, it's not bad, it's just not as quick as I thought it was going to be. Now in terms of zero to 100, this is what it looks like. Now with that extra weight, has it lost anything in terms of handling dynamics? Not really, it feels fairly sprightly as we go through a few corners here. It sits nice and flat. You don't really feel that extra weight of all the hybrid components, so that's a big positive that you're not going to lose out on any of that inherent sportiness you always find in a Mazda 3. Steering feel is good, but what I'm not loving here is brake pedal feel. When you get onto the brake pedal, it is extremely firm. You really have to get your foot stuck into it. There, I mean, it's not like it doesn't have the braking performance, it's just that perception of feel it kind of feels like there's no more travel left in it when you go to rest your foot on the brake. You really have to get stuck into it for anything to happen. But what about ride comfort? It is a really pleasant place to be. There doesn't feel like there's much of a difference over the regular Mazda 3s, and that's a good thing because they've absolutely nailed the ability to have a nice looking 18 inch alloy wheel with a fairly low profile tire, and then a ride that is just as nice as any other car in this segment, if not better. Keep in mind that this car uses a torsion beam at the rear. At this price point, a lot of its competitors, such as the Hyundai i30, use an independent rear suspension setup. Yes, I know that's a good way to save money, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. The average punter isn't going to notice that this is a torsion beam setup as opposed to an independent rear suspension setup. Now, what about visibility? Visibility out the front is fine. Out the sides, it's good. You get that blind spot monitoring system. The wing mirrors are fairly big as well. Visibility out the back is pretty poor. It's quite a narrow envelope there, so it's pretty tricky to see out the rear of the car. One thing we are noticing here is road noise. On coarse chip surfaces, there is a fair bit of tire noise coming into the cabin. Mazda has improved drastically over the outgoing generation of the Mazda 3 in terms of noise that infiltrates the cabin, but I think there's probably still a little bit of work to be done. Okay, Skyactiv X technology. Is it the revolution that Mazda says it is? Well, it kind of is. It's actually really cool technology and the way they've been able to pioneer this and make this car much, much smoother is really cool, but it comes at a price premium. Three grand over the 2.5 litre version of this car without the Skyactiv X tech is a big step forward, especially when you're not seeing such a big reduction in fuel economy. If you were super serious about wanting to save the planet, I think the Toyota Corolla Hybrid is a far better option. It uses less fuel and it costs much less as well. So look, this will be bought by early adopters and people that want to be part of this pioneering tech, but I don't know if it'll take off as much as Mazda says it will. Let me know in the comments below what you think and whether you think Mazda's done the right thing with this instead of going for a proper hybrid car. If you did find this review useful, make sure you hit the like button and follow it up with the subscribe and press the bell icon that's going to tell you every single time we drive something different. But until next time, take it easy.